This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. Next up on the Mutual Audio Network, fiction from our future. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. The Leviathan Chronicles Season 3 The story thus far. McAllen also and her strike force have found a Starstone. After engaging Sension and the Black Door Group in an aerial battle over Manhattan, McAllen and Anton were able to locate fragments of the Starstone in the wreckage of a psychic energy tracking device. With the fragments in hand, McAllen has returned to Leviathan to heal Evangeline and bring her out of her coma. But Sension and the Black Door Group were able to escape with the help of Alexander. Rebecca von Alt, otherwise known as the Countess, was able to locate the escaped Seraxian aliens deep within the central African jungle. The group has flown to the banks of the Sangar River, and after surviving an attack of deadly African army ants, is now ready to begin a several-day trek into the jungle to finally meet with the aliens. But Jeffrey Tully remains in New York City. He has finally found Toshi Tanaka, the kidnapped son of Yakuza boss Kasunori Tanaka, who has been holding Oberlin St. Clair hostage. Tully has a short window of time to get Toshi back to Japan in order to save his best friend. And now, Chapter 42, The Buffer Station. New York City's JFK Airport, Terminal 7. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of our flight crew, we'd like to welcome you aboard ANA Flight 324, non-stop from New York's JFK Airport to Narita Airport in Tokyo. Our approximate flight time will be 12 hours and 30 minutes, and we'll be cruising at an altitude of... Tully, Anton, and Toshi shuffled awkwardly down the far aisle of the 777 aircraft before coming to seats 2D and 2G in the middle aisle of first class. Here we go, Toshi. This is you and me. Aren't these seats cool? Feels like a spaceship, right? Wait a second. Where's my seat? Oh, uh, let me look at the ticket I bought you. Um... Ah... Uh, I see. You've got a middle seat also. Only yours is about 30 rows back that way. I beg your pardon? Are you bloody serious, coach? You have me flying in coach while you sit here. Gosh, these flights get so booked up nowadays. You probably remember when the airlines were still regulated. Boy, I bet those were the days, right? Now they just cram everybody in like sardines. No dignity to it at all. I can see there's an empty seat right there. Yeah, but I had to book that in case Toshi needed some place to put his comic books. Or the Kit Kat I bought him. Fucking imbecile. Is there a problem here, gentlemen? No, no problem, ma'am. I'm just trying to help this gentleman, well, this man, find his seat. Based on his ticket, I think he's back a few rows, but I'm not really familiar with that part of the aircraft. Let me see your ticket, sir. You're in coach seat 37F. I need you to find your seat, sir. You're blocking the aisle for other passengers. I... Listen, I'm going to try to send Toshi back with some warm nuts. I might eat most of the cashews, but whatever's left, I promise that we'll... I'll get you for this, Tully. Tully looked down and saw Toshi was staring at him, surprised. What? I heard Coach is a lot nicer on these Asian airlines. With Anton now relegated to the far rear of the aircraft, Toshi and Tully nestled into the luxurious seating pods that populated first class of all Nippon Airways. The wide, plush seats seemed to entirely swallow Toshi's young frame, as the 23-inch touchscreen monitor in front of him flashed images of his dining options, as well as a satellite map of their location. Tully, on the other hand, seemed utterly oh, fascinated man, by the extensive sweet. alcohol selection the menu. and the contents of his complimentary it. toiletries case. Toshi stuff. remained silent as he sat in his seat, buckled his seatbelt and turned off the video monitor staring straight ahead. Toshi, isn't this great? Sitting up in first class? You can ask for anything you want and they'll get it for you. It's like being in a flying restaurant. Mr. Tully, can I get you a beverage before takeoff? 
cocktail or wine? Tully looked at the sad-faced boy. Uh, no. Um, nah, I'm all right. Thank you. Toshi, uh, do you want something to nibble on? Look, I, uh, I got you some chocolate. Here. You, you gotta be hungry. Tully placed a Kit Kat bar on the armrest while Toshi refused to look or speak to Tully. Hey, listen. I'm not a bad guy. I'm just trying to get you back home, to your dad, you know? He loves you, and he's been really worried about you. He wants you back home where you're safe. Aren't you excited to be going back home? No. What? I, I don't get it. Why not? I wanted to stay with my friends. Those guys? Those black door goons? Those are really bad guys, Toshi. I mean, they, they kill people. They hurt them. You don't want to be around that. Leave me alone. Hey, come on. You don't want to be with that guy Jason Sterling. He's a lunatic, and he, he doesn't even look like a person. I mean, that dude is scary, and he could have really hurt you badly. No, he wouldn't. Wh why do you say that? Toshi casually opened the various storage compartments inside of the seating area, ignoring Tully's question. Finally, Tully placed his hand over Toshi's. Hey, Toshi, I said, why wouldn't Jason Sterling hurt you? Because he needed me. How did he need you? It looked like he needed a big boot shoved up his ass, but why would... Because it wasn't his fault. They're trying to control his mind. He's trying to do the right thing. Who's trying to get a hold of his mind? Excuse me. We're going to need you to bring your seat back all the way forward and make sure that your seatbelt is fastened for takeoff. Yeah, sure. Look, I'm sorry you're not happy about going home, but pretty soon you're going to be back with your dad and your family. So? So there must be something you're looking forward to. Maybe seeing your friends, going to school. You gotta be excited about going back to school. Okay, maybe not school, but, but you're gonna see your dad. It's your dad. He doesn't like me. Oh, hey. Hey, I know for a fact that's not true. I know he's been doing everything in his power to get you back home. Believe me. Toshi sat unmoved and silent. <sighs> hey, listen, don't worry about it. If you don't feel like talking, we don't have to talk. I mean, sometimes I don't feel like talking to anyone. Actually, most of the time, nobody really wants to talk to me. <laughs> Yeah. Listen, I know you must have been through a whole lot. I just want you to know that I'm not going to hurt you. I'm one of the good guys. I just want to get you back to your dad so you can be with your family. He's not my real family. What's that supposed to mean? You should order a drink. I know you want one. No. No, that's okay. I shouldn't. Just have one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, maybe I will have. Just one. A few minutes later, Tully sipped on his Suntory Yamazaki whiskey. Wow. The sweet, so... cool smokiness felt good on his tongue, and he could feel a gentle wave of relaxation float through him after the first few sips. He thought back to New York, having just barely escaped from the Black Door Group and the onslaught of local and federal authorities. He didn't care anymore about being arrested or getting thrown into jail. He only cared about two things. One, getting Oberlin away from Kasanori Tanaka and the Yakuza. But the other thing he cared about, well, that was much less straightforward. Jesus, McCallan, did you have to dislocate my jaw? Oh, gee, I don't know, Tully. Did you have to leave me while I was being fucking strangled by a homicidal maniac? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Does your jaw hurt? Because my neck still does! Callan, I already told you. I knew Anton was right behind me. Oberlin was about to be killed on the other side of that portal. If I didn't do something, he was gonna die for certain. Guess what? I almost died for certain. Well, you're still here. No thanks to you. Hey, I got the right of way here, buddy. Um, please watch the road, Tully. Tully's cramped taxi cab swerved through the congested traffic on Manhattan's Did west side, narrowly missing off. a delivery truck exiting on 96th Street. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize your life was so much more important than anyone else's. More important than Oberlin's, now that you're a little Miss Immortal. I didn't know the world was supposed to grind to a halt every time you chipped a nail. No! No, I don't expect the world to bend backwards to save me. Just the people I'm sleeping with! You... you slept with Tully. Is this because I didn't say that I loved you? I was being strangled to death! And I got Anton out of the Med Tower to your location to save your life. Which you could have done yourself if you fucking cared about me! Oh yeah, I must not care at all. That's why I've come all the way from the freezing mountains of Tibet and got tortured in Japan to come find you. I just saved you from a psychopath who was going to kill you and throw your body in the river, but no, no, I must not care at all about you. Really? Really, Tully? You came all the way to New York just to find me? Well, yeah. I mean, you and 
Toshi. Oh, so it wasn't just for me. It's not always about just you. <laughs> hey, watch where you're going. You know, you should really watch the road. She seems really angry at him. If I didn't come in when I did, that Sterling guy was about to do some serious damage to you and Anton. How about a little gratitude? Oh, sorry. I've spent the last few days breaking Anton out of jail, getting blown up on an oil rig, and almost falling out of the sky in Manhattan. So I didn't have time to write a thank you note to your fragile male ego. See, this is why I can't even talk oh, to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I find it really hard to talk to you when you leave to go to the other side of the world. I can't believe you. Don't you even care about Oberlin? Of course I care about Oberlin. You know, if it wasn't for him, I never would have helped you get to the Cedar Realm. That's exactly right. If it wasn't for him, I never would have gotten any help from you. Hey, since you walked into my life, I've been shot at, my boat got blown up, my best friend was kidnapped, I've been tortured, almost froze to death, and had torpedoes shot at me. Don't sit there and act like you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh, I see. So you didn't have any massive debt to the Yakuza, bad breath, and a boat that was already falling apart. So all your problems are my fault. No! I mean, yeah! Do they always fight like this? I don't know. Probably. Uh, hey, can you guys keep it down back there? I'm trying to drive a cab over here. The taxi cab veered off the West Side Highway onto 56th Street before turning onto 11th Avenue. You know, you're really lucky. No. I no, you know who's really lucky? Your ex-wife, because she doesn't have to deal with the disappointment of knowing you anymore. Hey, where am I even taking you guys? I want you out of my cab. It's not even your cab. You stole it. You stole this cab? You mean like stole from somebody that already was waiting for a cab? No, more like actually physically took another man's taxi cab, drove away, and left him holding two hot dogs. Man, that's cold. We need to get back to Leviathan. Tali, get us down to the tip of Manhattan, by the ferry terminal. We can probably catch one to Governor's Island. Why Governor's Island? It's a decommissioned Coast Guard base located on its own island in the middle of New York Harbor. It's open to the public on certain days as a park, but hardly anyone ever goes there. It's probably the least populated area in all of New York City. And it's right in the harbor, so I can arrange some sort of transport to get us back underwater and back to Leviathan. Tully drove his stolen yellow taxi cab through the Wall Street area of New York, past the South Street seaport, to arrive at the ferry terminal at Manhattan's southern tip. He parked the cab beside a fire hydrant and stepped around to open McAllen's door, while Toshi, Keitha Watson and Robertson exited in the rear. Nice parking job. I'm not parking. I'm dumping it. Yeah, I know how that feels. Hey, look, I'm, I'm really, really sorry for what I did. Yeah, yeah, you should be. I would have done anything to help you and you just, just... McAllen looked out at the flashing ocean just beyond the ferry terminal. Look, I need to get back to Leviathan. They're counting on us, and we found a star stone so that we Listen, can... Listen, McAllen, I gotta get Toshi back to Japan. It's the only way I can get Oberlin free. Hey, slow down! Who the hell said I wanted you to come with me? No, I, I just thought that, you, you know, that... You're going to Japan now to save Oberlin, right? You said some gangster is holding him? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's why Anton? I... Anton? Have... I want you to go with Tully. What? What? You gotta be kidding, Callan. I really don't think so. Anton, this is simple. You have to go with him. I don't need Anton to help me find my seat on the airplane. Why would you Because even... you're going to fuck this up, Tully. I care about Oberlin, and I want to see him safe. Tanaka's not just gonna hand him over to you and let you walk away as soon as you give him his son back. He's gonna double-cross you, and you're too stupid to see it coming. I do agree with part of what you just said, but I don't see how... Anton, this is obvious. The aliens are still out there. If Toshi was being held by Jason Sterling to coerce Kasunori Tanaka, that means Tanaka must know something about Black Door. Black Door just escaped, and I'm betting their tracker is going to lead them right to the Soraxians. If Tanaka-san knows anything about Black Door, then he might know where they're heading and where the aliens are kept. You need to go with Tully. Hey, listen, I don't need a babysitter. I can... You listen to me, Tully. If you care about Oberlin, then you should be thanking me that I'm giving you more tactical support. Take Anton, get Oberlin, and get your ass home. That is all you should be worried about, not your fucking ego. Tully stopped for a moment and realized she was right. Well, I mean, I guess it wouldn't be the worst idea to have a little backup. But hey, as soon as I get back, I want Just to... get Oberlin and stay safe. Anton will contact me after you guys have made the exchange. Tully moved towards McAllen to embrace her, but she turned swiftly and started walking towards the ferry terminal. Watson, Robertson, you're with me. I guess we're with her. Guess so. The trio left Tully, Anton, and young Toshi standing by themselves in the teeming plaza as the Staten Island ferry began to unload its passengers into Manhattan. What do you say, Anton? Feel like getting some sushi? Only if you promise to eat the fugu. Toshi, you have to protect me to make sure Anton doesn't kill me with his sparkling wit. Toshi stared passively at Tully. Hey, we're gonna take you home now, Toshi. 
I'm going to keep you safe and get you home to your dad. Tully grabbed Toshi's small hand and walked over to the curb. Come on, Anton. Let's catch a cab and head to JFK Airport. Splendid. Try not to steal this one, Tully. The Congo jungle, Africa. Sentron removed the lids on one of the heavy metal crates in their campsite. Most of the area was devastated by a sudden attack of African army ants the previous night that had left the group covered in painful bites and lacerations. All the group except one. When the hundreds of thousands of ants descended on the camp, Jason Sterling stood shirtless in the middle of the swarm and escaped without a single bite on his body. Here. Put these on. These are the environmental suits that we'll wear during the trek. Are you crazy? We'll pass out in those things. The temperature's over 95 degrees with over 100% humidity. Which is exactly why we'll be wearing them. Wow, I remember when these suits were just prototypes. I don't trust your technology, Senshin. I don't really care what you think, Jason. Wit suspiciously laid out the silver suit on the ground and then started to put it on. The suit bore some resemblance to a standard hazmat suit in that it covered the wearer's entire body from head to toe, but the e-suits were far more structured and segmented. Containing a tight inner layer, the suits hugged the contours of the wearer's body and offered a snug fit similar to compression types. <laughs> These feel really tight, Senshin. And heavy, Jesus. Senshin reached back into the crate and removed four semi-translucent helmets that sealed hermetically at the neckline. Once the four of them had all donned the e-suits, Senshin showed them the activator switches located on the wrist pads. Press the green button to prime the suits. As soon as the buttons were depressed, each suit vibrated slightly around the frame of its wearer before expanding two inches off the inner layer of the suit that rested against the wearer's skin. Instantly, all the members of the team felt the refreshing breeze of chilled air beginning to circulate through their suits. My god, it feels amazing. Mm, I love the built-in air conditioning. Mine feels like there's fluid caught underneath. The outer inflated layer contains a membrane containing a non-Newtonian fluid that we coat our submersibles with in Leviathan. The more pressure is applied, the harder the surface becomes. Like body armor. Exactly. But when gradual pressure is applied, like walking, the fluid remains liquid and pliable. Try moving. Every member of the team was amazed at the effortless movement of the e-suits. They were surprised to feel completely insulated and isolated from the sweltering, prickly environment that surrounded them. <sighs> the bad news is that we won't have much food for the next three days. The good news is that'll keep our packs light. Here, it's time to get moving. We've got a lot of ground to cover. And so the team walked forward, heading away from the silty riverbanks of the Sangar River toward a narrow single track path leading southeast. As soon as the group got under the tree canopy, the environment around them darkened precipitously. Every possible shade of green and brown bloomed around them. Fern leaves the size of grown men blocked the narrow path and needed to be hacked down by the machete wielded by Sunshine. Rebecca could feel the constant sensation of vegetation pushing up against her, but her e-suit kept her protected from the cutting thorns and sharp branches that inundated the overgrown pathway. After hiking for three hours, the e-suits were completely covered in moisture and green stains, but the helmets and the bodies of everyone in the team remained perfectly dry. How do you know we're heading in the right direction, Senshin? Rebecca, how do I know? Because you've got me. And I say we are. How could the aliens survive in this environment? There's natural predators everywhere. The aliens are still alive, I can assure you of that. But I think you already know that, don't you, Jason? Sterling trudged forward wordlessly, taking care to follow behind the path that had been established. Whenever the group stopped to rest, swarms of flies and stinging insects buzzed around the helmets of the group. But being removed from physical contact with the jungle meant that Whit didn't even notice the foot-long shiny black centipede that was crawling along the shoulder of his suit. Wait, you got a, uh... What? What is it? Uh, never mind. The group continued their slow march through the dense rainforest. Vines thicker than fire hoses were covered by thinner vines that seemed to stretch down to the ground, while others reached up to strangle the very trees they clung to. Still more hung sideways across the pathway, giving no sense of where they started or ended. The jungle seemed utterly endless in every direction, giving no quarter to move or breathe. It literally felt like the forest was pressing down on them, trying to swallow the team into its dense fabric. Soon the foliage grew so thick that no member of the team could see their feet or the ground beneath them anymore. They were swimming through an emerald ocean with leaves and foliage in every imaginable shape and size. 
Hours dragged by where the group might only hike a few hundred yards, and others where they could regain the path once more to improve their progress a mile at a time. After another two exhaustive hours, Sentrum began to swing his machete slower, as the slight incline in the ground began to drain him of his strength. He tried to force his feet to move faster, but a sudden downpour soaked the ground, making traction become increasingly elusive. Jason, it's your turn. You take the lead. Jason nodded wordlessly and moved past Rebecca and Witt to stand in front of Sension. Use the compass heading inside your heads-up display. We want to say heading southeast. I know where we're going. May I have the machete, please? Sension hesitated for an instant before remembering that his e-suit would protect against any sudden impact. At least, it was supposed to. Jason sensed his hesitation and smiled slightly. Be careful, Jason. Trust me. I know how to handle a knife. <laughs> Surprisingly, Jason Sterling was indeed adept at use with the machete, and was by far the fastest at trailblazing and clearing the path through the bush than either of the other three team members. The agitated cries of ancient primates and other sinister creatures of the jungle called out to the strange intruders plowing noisily through the sinister sanctum of the earth. A thick haze floated 40 feet above the trail and diffused what little sunlight permeated through the heavy trees, and the forest seemed to grow darker with each step. The only variation in color from the endless green and brown that engulfed them were the vibrant songbirds hidden high in the canopy and the brightly colored tree frogs, toxic to the touch, that bounced harmlessly off the team's e-suits. The group marched for another five hours, hacking and scrambling without rest. The e-suits continually adjusted the interior temperature of the group to avoid overheating due to the exertion of their track. So, what are your plans when you finally meet the aliens, Senshan? To thank them for your hundreds of years of gallivanting across the globe? <laughs> or apologize for the fact that your people's welcome wagon to other forms of life might leave something to be desired. I'm not gonna say this again to you, Sterling. You keep equating me to Evangeline. I was never part of the decision to imprison the extraterrestrials. I'm a bit more curious to hear what you have to say, Jason. Going this deep into the jungle and allowing your body to become mutated seems terribly altruistic just to save some incarcerated strangers. Especially for a group that spent so much of its time trying to kill other people. You can paint yourself as innocent, Senshin. But we know now that your people have been secretly influencing world events for the last several centuries. That's a lot of power for a group of people nobody knows exists. That's quite a statement coming from door number 12. How many people know of your existence? What would they say if Black Door ever came to face the light of day? Oh, I think you should just... Ah! Jason Sterling suddenly dropped ten feet lower and plunged into a deep pool of murky water within a concealed dark brown forest bog. He sank just below his chin line and flailed in the slick mud trying to gain purchase. The water! The water! Get me out! Get me the group struggled to race forward, discovering that the ground had abruptly dropped off over a hidden ledge into the putrid, stretching body of water below. Jason, get me out! Jason! Jason! Jason, it's all right. The suit you're wearing is waterproof and designed to keep you dry. You're going to be okay. Press the right button on your wrist control. Jason, the right button. Jason Sterling thrashed frantically and continued to sink lower into the bog. The water was so thick with dirt and leaves that he struggled to see his own wrist, let alone find the button he needed. The right button, Jason. Jason could hear Sension on his intercom, but seeing some filthy water wash over his helmet seized his heart in terror. If allowed, the water would burn through his skin. He grabbed for his wrist, searching for the control pad, pushing any surface that felt different, any button that he could. Jason Sterling felt his e-suit expand another few inches off the surface of his skin, inflating with air making him twice as buoyant. He immediately rose to the surface and stabilized with his chest floating above the waterline. You're okay, Jason. You've got it. Yes. Yes, it's okay. I'm all right. I'm all right. Are you sure you're okay? What's the water depth? How far is the crossing where you are? I... I can just about stand. The buoyancy makes it easier to move forward. The water extends about another quarter mile, it looks like. Hold on, we're coming down. Whit, Sension, and Rebecca cautiously approached the hidden ledge that Jason Sterling had fallen over. They each grabbed one of the thick vines that descended into the water for support and began to climb down. I have to hand it to you, Sension. These suits aren't half bad. Do you think... <laughs> The brown water of the bog exploded as a 15-foot Nile crocodile lunged above the surface with its glistening mouth agape. Turning slightly to the side, its massive jaws clamped down across Jason Sterling's chest. 
and immediately spun its body to drive Jason deep under the water. Jason! Whip leapt down into the water, while Sension stood impassively halfway down the side of the steep riverbank, staring at the massacre that was occurring. Jason! I'm coming! You've gotta hold on! You've got to- The gargantuan tail of the crocodile snapped left and right, <laughs> pummeling into Whip Roberts and sending him sprawling onto the slippery mud. He struggled to get back on his feet before he saw the croc shake Jason's body back and forth before pulling him deep under the water. Jason! Jason! The dark surface of the water soon grew calm and placid, and there was no sign that a man had just been eaten alive by a prehistoric monster. Sension looked down at the scene below as he and Rebecca climbed down the vines to join Wit on the riverbank. I'm, I'm sorry, Wit. There was nothing you that we could... fucking liar! <laughs> You oh, didn't even try to save him. You stood there, you fucking stood there, you son of a bitch. You fucking stay away from Fenchin. Rebecca raced to get behind Whit Roberts and wrapped one of the vines around his neck. She tried to pull back hard, but could feel the surface of Whit's suit instantly harden, protecting his neck from the tightening vine. I'll rip your helmet off and leave whatever's left of you to the jungle. Do you have any idea how stupid you are? We're the last hope. You could have saved Jason, but you chose just to watch. It's what you immortals always do, you goddamn cow. Something stirred behind Wit, causing him to spin around defensively. It's all right, Wit. Turns out I'm not as tasty as I look. Jason Sterling slowly emerged out of the mud-colored water and walked towards the group that was now sprawled in the mud. From his left hand hung the bleeding forelimb of the crocodile that had attacked him. The ragged edge at its tip showed that it had been clearly ripped off from the beast's body. Several of the crocodile's teeth were embedded in Sterling's e-suit, and three tiny trickles of golden fluid were dripping from the lacerations in his suit. You are right, Sension. These suits do provide protection against any sudden impact. Oh, Jason, are you okay? Jason stared at Sension. I'm all right, Wit. It's just good to know that we can all count on each other in case an accident were to occur. So tell me, Countess. How much further until we reach our friends? I... I think we're about halfway there. Well then, let's get through this water and make camp for the night. That's fine, Jason. Once we get to camp, I should have a patch kit with me that I might be able to... But Sterling had already turned around and was walking back into the bog on the southeasterly heading. Sension looked at Rebecca and then Wit, and then proceeded to follow Sterling, wading more than waist deep into the water. The group trudged and swam for the next mile through the swamp. Rebecca could feel strange creatures brushing up against her underwater, and sharp objects shifting nervously under her feet when she touched the bottom. She utilized all her concentration to focus on Sension walking ahead of her, and did not consider what was lying below the surface. Finally, the water level subsided, and the group came to walk on the firm ground of the jungle again. We'll make camp here beside these ferns. Here? Where will we set up? There's no room to- Sension just laid down on the floor of the jungle, letting his weight bend all of the plants beneath him. This is camp. The ground is the bed, the trees are the walls. Good night. Wait a second. What if it rains, or, or what if- And then Whit remembered that he was wearing his e-suit that would keep him dry, keep his body temperate, and protect him from any slithering creatures of the night. Sension was right. This was camp. It felt decidedly odd to be crouching on the jungle floor and laying on one's back to sleep, while rain poured down on you from every direction and insects crawled across the clear visor of your helmet. Despite that Wit had seen the e-suit protect Jason Sterling from the impact of the crocodile attack, he still felt vulnerable trying to sleep amongst the deafening chorus of nocturnal creatures of the jungle. The next morning, the group trudged on, switching the lead every few hours as their arms grew tired of hacking through the endless foliage. Eventually, the occasional river crossings grew less frequent, and the ground seemed to slope downward, giving some respite to everyone's exhausted leg muscles. Rebecca increased her gait to walk alongside Sension. Have you chosen your moment yet? No, but like I said, I actually want to see the aliens before I make any move to rid us of Black Door. I was really hoping that Croc would save me half my work. Well, I have a strange feeling you might have less time than you think. Why do you say that? There's something about Sterling. He's changing. It's like he's getting stronger the deeper we go into the jungle. He's not as winded as the rest of us. I'm just saying that you might want to... Oh! Rebecca! Rebecca abruptly fell to her knees. Rebecca! Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. What happened? I just felt... Oh, we're, we're getting close, Sinchen. I don't think we have much farther to go. The aliens just cried out. They're... something about their energy. They're anxious. Jason, what do you know about this? You 
can sense them too, can't you? She's right. We're getting closer. What are the aliens anxious about, Sterling? Why do they just send out a psychic blast? I don't know, Senshin. Maybe they don't like her mortals. Maybe they're a little pissed off after being held against their will for a thousand years. Maybe they just want to get home. Why don't we get there and you can ask them yourself? Come on. This way. Jason Sterling took up the lead and began trailblazing a path further south for the remainder of the day. He seemed immune from the fatigue that was seeping into the rest of the group. The team spent another night sleeping on the jungle floor, dozing imperviously while the other inhabitants of the jungle slithered and climbed over them. At one point, Rebecca could feel a bush viper glide over her legs and crawl past her helmet, flicking its forked tongue inches from her face, while she breathed calmly within the protection of her e-suit. Beautiful. Nature, life, everywhere there's life here. The energy, it feels so different from where we're going. What is lying ahead of us? On the last morning, the team rose early at first light and began their final push south. Sterling seemed even more energetic than yesterday, and at one point, Sentium found himself having trouble keeping up. By early afternoon, the humid, cloudy air of the jungle appeared to lighten, and the haze that permeated the forest in every direction dissipated slightly. As the group hiked further, they could see a clearing up ahead, and the sounds of the jungle creatures suddenly felt louder and more resonant. We're very close now. When the group reached the clearing, they looked down and realized that they were standing on the lip of a massive sinkhole, stretching for a diameter of 200 meters before them was a titanic circular hole in the jungle floor. Caused by the ceiling collapse of a colossal underground cave, the sinkhole descended approximately 300 meters down along steep limestone and shale cliffs. My gosh! While the sinkhole was amazingly impressive from a geological perspective, it was not remotely as astonishing as the 100-meter-high stone temple that sat at its bottom. The tall, squat temple was constructed in a style reminiscent of Dravidian architecture, similar to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, with its soaring jagati spirals and heavy stone pillars. The structure was largely overgrown by moss, vines and trees, making it almost blend in perfectly with the surrounding jungle. A narrow, steep path was visible winding around the perimeter, with tight switchbacks leading down to the sinkhole floor. How in the goddess name are we ever going to get down into that? More importantly, how the hell are we ever going to get out of it? While Rebecca and Sension gazed open-mouthed at the hidden temple nestled in the sunken belly of the Congo, Whit Roberts moved aside quietly to stand closer to Jason Sterling. What the hell is this place? Can you sense the aliens here, Jason? Most certainly. They're here, Wit. And our plan is finally going to begin. We've made it to our visitors. This is where the aliens are. This is the buffer station. You have been listening to Season 3 of The Leviathan Chronicles. To listen to all of the Season 3 episodes right now and get the exclusive epilogue episode, purchase the Season 3 Director's Cut at leviathanchronicles.com or click the link in the show notes for immediate download. The Leviathan Chronicles was written and created by Christoph Lepupka, executive produced by Robin Shaw, produced and musical composition by Luke Allen, directed by Nobi Nakanishi. For more information and news, visit our website or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for supporting us and thank you for listening. Hi, this is Christoph Laputka, and I want to thank you for listening to Season 3 of the Leviathan Chronicles. I hope you've been enjoying our most action-packed season yet, because we want to keep growing the Leviathan universe with spin-off stories and future seasons. But we need your help. That's why I'm asking you to check out our first-ever Kickstarter campaign by going to leviathanchronicles.com slash kickstarter, or just clicking on the link in our show notes. There, we have many levels of support, as well as some really amazing rewards. One of our favorite characters is Salty Squid Bartender, Angus McKay. He really appreciates your support, and one of the rewards we're offering is a limited edition recipe book for Angus's favorite Leviathan cocktails that we found in an old corner of the squid. You can find cool items like that and much more on Kickstarter by going to leviathanchronicles.com slash kickstarter. We can't wait to get started on creating more audio dramas like Leviathan. Your help really does ensure that future projects will have the resources they need to make it from our headphones to yours. Thank you again for listening to C3.
Season 3, and thank you for checking out our Kickstarter campaign. I'll see you guys real soon. Leviathan Audio Production One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. There! That's how long twenty seconds are. The Center for Disease Control recommends you wash your hands for at least twenty seconds as often as possible. We don't think about it a lot, but more germs are transmitted by the hands than by any other source. So keep them clean. Soap and water for 20 seconds, and you'll help prevent the spread of COVID-19. And maybe some other nasty stuff as well. This was a public service announcement from the Mutual Audio Network.